So now it's my pleasure to welcome you all here again and welcome you to October is History Month every year here at the uh, Camden Public Library. We have a history center upstairs, which you're all welcome to come visit. And uh, we have so much stuff, so many photos that we don't get a chance to show. So we take the opportunity during our history month to, to make a display such as this of some of the uh, photos that we have up there. Um, Notes on a Lost Flute, a field guide to the Wabanaki by Carrie Hardy is a wonderful book and it's heavily illustrated and I've learned so much from it, learned about how the native Mainers used language, how their language referred to largely to food and food and place. And one thing that I learned was about the, the pitched battle between the Wabanaki or the Wawanaks and the uh, Terratines, which took place right here. Yeah. And the Terratines uh, killed the leader of the Wawanaks, the Basheba. Is that how one says? Yeah, yeah, that's close enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. As it comes down through the centuries, that's another thing you will notice from reading this book. As it comes down through the 10th centuries, words shift inside. They shift left and right. And we're lucky to have, uh, if we have any uh, reference to the original language. Yes. Um, so I recommend the book highly, and I recommend uh, that you get a chance, if you get a chance to hear Kerry Hardy, that you that you come hear him. So I can see that uh, my advice is paying off. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Well, it's it's nice to see uh, familiar faces and and some some new ones that I'll meet tonight, maybe. Uh, this stuff's been inside my head growing over the last five years because back in late 2017 or early 2018, a man named Jack Chen, who at the time was the head of the Asian Pacific uh, American Institute at NYU uh, and who summered up here in Maine, got in touch with me because he had read Notes on a Lost Flute and really liked it and said, who does this kind of uh, work with native language and landscape and place uh, down down in the uh, Hudson River part of the world? And I and I said, oh, I, I don't think anybody does because most people in in today's educational system sort of have to stay in their silo um, and and just focus on one thing. And what actually enabled me to uh, uh, to write notes on a lost flute was that uh, no none of the different clubs, archaeologists or historians or linguists or anyone else wanted me as a member. So I just sort of <laughs> trespassed around on the outskirts of all of them and and uh, and picked up some things from each and and then was privy to some insights that I wouldn't have been if I'd been stuck in any one discipline. So uh, when I told Jack that the language was the same down there, Algonquian is pretty much Algonquian. The dialectic differences vary from the Cree people up to almost up to the Arctic Circle to, uh, you know, uh, indigenous people in North Carolina at the time of contact and all the way to the Mississippi River. Um, all the way to the Gaspé Peninsula, but it was all the same language, uh, and with a little bit of uh, thought, you can you can if you know it from one place, you can recognize words uh, from from another group uh, of Algonquian speakers. So with that, he said, well, then you, you have to help with this project. The Ford Foundation uh, was waving a bag of money at him. Because he had been uh, he had been on the mayor's uh, the mayor's commission for studying statues and monuments in New York City, along with Darren Walker, who was the president of the Ford Foundation at the time. Maybe he still is. And yeah. that commission was quickly mired in politics. Um, Try pulling down a Columbus statue in an Italian neighborhood and, 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 and see what kind of phone calls you get at 3 a.m. Uh, so they, D Darren Walker said to Jack, look, the commission's not going to be able to do anything, but uh, independent researchers could and we would fund them. So with that, that, that kicked off my uh, project on the Hudson River. And, uh, 
I was brought in Jack thought to uh, to do uh, native language and native landscape connections that sort of thing but as it's happened i've just become the uh the cartographer and sole researcher for the project and have been doing that for for five years um so uh i always caution people when i do a slide and talk show to put on your seat belts but uh, tonight it's even worse because I, I have more to cover. It's, uh, it's not your fault that I've been working on this stuff for five years, but uh, do those doors lock, Ken? <laughs> yeah, anyway, you're going to hear about stuff from all five years. Um, so, yes, if, if, uh, if I'm going too fast, if I'm not speaking loudly enough, just get my attention. And if you have a, have a question and it's really timely while that image is up, uh, feel free to ask, but the the pace will be sprightly because uh, we have a lot to to talk about. So this, uh, yeah, I'll back it up. One, this is uh, there is a book coming, and this is what I'm thinking the cover of the book will be. And if you've read the the following uh, uh, explanation, Emmanuel Downing, who is the father of George Downing, who Downing Street in London is named after. Uh, and who was a, a thoroughly despicable character, uh, George, the, the, the son. Um, the father was very cunning, very canny, spent some time in America. Uh, the father advised John Winthrop, who was, who was very pious and very self-satisfied that he was the Lord's chosen messenger, sitting on his hill in Boston and making the city on the hill that the whole world was going to admire. Emmanuel Downing was smart enough to say, you know, just walk away from what you have there in Boston. The mouth of the Hudson River is where you should be. All the reports are that the growing season's longer, the fur trade is better, the navigation is better, you can ride the tide all the way upriver almost to Canada. Just get out of Boston. They've, they've actually got real soil down there. And, uh, but, but Winthrop, uh, to admit that he was wrong would, would be admitting that God was wrong because Winthrop saw himself as God's uh, agent here. So Winthrop dug in his heels in Boston, and uh, the Dutch came there instead. But anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's just see where the slides take us. One of the first things I convinced Jack of, Jack Chen of, was that we needed to start all the way back at the, at the last glacier. Um, so here's, here's a, a strange view looking down on the North Pole. The areas in black are what was covered by ice. But what's also interesting is if you see the, the rim of kind of hazy bluish green around the edges of the continents, that's reflecting the fact that so much fresh water was tied up in ice sheets that the ocean um, was uh, significantly lower. Um, the down, down around the mouth of the Hudson, where I've been uh, studying, uh, the shoreline was another 100 miles out to sea from where it is now on the coastal plain, to give you some idea. So uh, very different landscape, and we're talking about 20, 21,000 years ago at the peak of glaciation. Here, here's what it looked like up here. The, uh, the orange shows the land as it is now, but if you can pick up this light yellow line, that's where, uh, that's where the shoreline was 11,000 years ago. So you could walk out the Georges Bank uh, a long ways off Cape Cod, and there was just one inlet that all those swordfish could come through to get into the Gulf of Maine. So a very different landscape uh, when all of the, and this is, this is after the ocean uh, had been rising for some time. Again, uh, the, the maximum amount of water was trapped in ice about 21,000 years ago. So even after 10,000 years of melting, uh, there was still that much of an exposed uh, coastal plain. Here's what it looked like down, down around what we now call New York and New Jersey. And maybe you can recognize New Jersey, uh, mouth of the Delaware River here, 
that blue stripe going across the Connell Shelf is the Hudson River Channel. Um, and that's, that's as far as the ice sheet got. So the spine of Long Island, if you've spent any time down there, is a big pile of gravel that the glacier bulldozed up uh, at its farthest uh, southern limit. When it started melting, the gravel was left behind, and that's, uh, that's kind of what Long Island is made of, mostly, is, is this glacially deposited gravel. So just a schematic again. Hope you can just see the ghosted outlines of Long Island over there. Here's the end moraine, that pile of gravel I'm talking about. And here's, uh, here's what happens. As the glacier recedes, so now we're... Uh, We've left a blue line where the ice had been before, but now it's moved back up um, what wasn't yet the Hudson. <laughs> uh, but we had glacial lakes forming of meltwater. Um, glacial Lake Passaic was about 40 miles long and about 10 miles wide. Uh, glacial uh, Lake Bayonne was a little bit smaller, and uh, they drained in different ways than they drained uh, a few years later. The as as the ice kept moving backward and the meltwater increased. Um, this is actually I'm going to walk over and show you this because it's a little bit tricky. There's a lot going on. The the crust of the earth has been depressed by the weight of the glacier, so that's still springing back up. So that's kind of changing where things drain. And if you've ever been to Patterson, New Jersey. There's a place there called the Great Falls, and that is one of three places where when the ice retreated back north of them, exit points were found for the water in Glacial Lake Passaic. And we're not talking about a small flow of water. We're talking about a massive flow coming down um, and, and uh, filling Glacial Lake Hackensack to the point where an alternative outlet was formed in what they call Lake Albany going up through Long Island Sound. So all of the water coming off the glacier was actually bending around and going up around Long Island. Um, as I say, this is kind of tricky stuff to wrap your head around. Oops, I went the wrong way, sorry. Glacial Lake Passaic, which I just showed you, this is this is one of the things that, that I'm doing with maps is trying to show different times and don't don't worry about reading it. It's a it's a glowing description for a, for a uh, an estate, a big, a big colonial estate. Uh, that yellow line goes down to Lucas von Beverhut uh, estate on the uh, on the former bed of Glacial Lake Passaic. So all of these estates are in the 1750 period. And this uh, the Lucas von Beverhut bought it from this William Kelly, who's, what's he selling? He's selling 2000 acres of land and, and it comes with all sorts of good stuff, including uh, but barns for the Negroes to live in and uh, all sorts of livestock, all sorts of orchards. But anyway, my, my point is the biggest colonial estates in New Jersey um, at, in 1750 were all situated uh, so they could be farming the soil left on the bottom of Glacial Lake Passaic. So even though that lake wasn't there in 1750, I've left the ghost image so you can hopefully understand uh, when you when you drive around places and and see big big farms in that uh, valley in New Jersey um, or read history books, Washington stayed in all of those estates during the Revolutionary War. He made base camps out of them. He was friends with these guys, and they all became the Federalists, basically. Um, but I show slides like this to show how events like the glacier did affect our colonial history and 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 the root of development that this country took. Going back now to more melting ice, and we're still sending it up around Long Island. Uh, this is now 18,500 years ago, but here's, here's where the fireworks start. And hopefully you can recognize 
the, uh, the outline of New York State there. Some of it's underwater, but uh, that's New York State and New Jersey's way down in the bottom uh, of it. Anyway, what happened? Uh, the first thing that happened, glacial lake wall kill, as soon as the ice got a little ways up the Hudson, that lake dumped out and ripped a hole through where Verrazano Narrows is now. That burst of water getting out of Glacial Lake Wall Kill blew through the, uh, the dike that the end moraine had formed there. So now the Hudson was, was kind of draining where it does now. For the next bunch of thousands of years, say 5,000 years, Glacial Lake Albany filled the, the Hudson Valley to varying degrees as the ice kept retreating north and it got bigger and bigger. The real granddaddy of them all was Glacial Lake Iroquois, which had more than, more than the volume of Lake Erie and Lake Ontario combined. And for quite a few thousand years, uh, say two or 3,000 years, was draining through the Mohawk, kind of in the middle of the image. So that was where, and, and you can imagine as the glacier is really starting to melt now, um, the the uh, the volume of water the the flow in these rivers is you know 50 100 times what we ever would see in them today so the mohawk carves its way down through and then finally up at the top of the uh, slide the ice sheet migrates just uh, just north of the adirondacks and the last ice dam holding in glacial lake iroquois uh, erodes through and when that happens, uh, 800 cubic miles of water comes down the valley of the Hudson and reams, <laughs> reams its way to the ocean, you know, rolling along. They've, they've found boulders the size of, uh, of Volkswagens out on the continental shelf, you know, in terms of the kind of stuff that was moved and the kind of carving that happened. So that was when the modern channel of the Hudson um, took on its, its, its current configuration. They think that the release of this lake actually changed the global climate uh, when it happened. This was about 13,500 years ago. And they think it was enough of a cold water shock to the Gulf Stream that it changed things, changed the weather, and brought on a cold spell, uh, a global cold spell. So it was a, a lot of water that came down. Okay, so we're back now at those end moraines going up Long Island, and there's a couple there from, from one is from an earlier glaciation, uh, the Ronkonkoma moraine, and then the Harbor Hill moraine is the more recent one. But it's interesting, when you, when you think about Long Island and what happens there, you know, I've, I've, I've put some typical Long Island things like it was it was the the cradle of thoroughbred racing in America because it was all a sand and gravel plain and it was so easy to put in a racetrack. It was the cradle of aviation in America because you could put in airline airplane runways. It was where the first country clubs were for link style golf in this country, uh, like Shinnecock Hills. And it, the, the big pile of gravel made a great place to bury all the dead bodies from uh, New York City and Brooklyn um, because and that's what the Native Americans used it for too. There were burying grounds in sand and gravel left at the end moraine. Their biggest, the biggest native burying ground was right at the southwest tip here of Staten Island at a place called Burial Ridge. But that, that gravel and sand is great stuff for burying people. <laughs> Oh, and Levittown, yes, America's first first uh, community where you can't come home tipsy or you won't find your own house. Uh, I mean, what better what better canvas to put in a housing atrocity like Levittown than something that's just easy digging and and easy grading? So so that's the kind of stuff that happened on Long Island. Hundreds of gravel and sand mining businesses that did city building all through uh, the metropolitan area. Um, until about 10,000 years ago, we had these guys around. Uh, they, in Orange County, New York, which is on the northern border with, of New Jersey, uh, they found 32 mastodon 
uh, skeletons in Orange County alone. This one came from a little bit farther up the Hudson, a place called Temple Hill. But they were they were a prey for paleo hunters, uh, and they, they think it was about ten thousand years ago when they disappeared. Mm -hmm. The first people in this part of the world, as the ice sheet retreated, were there at least 13,000 years ago and maybe more. There's a rock shelter called Meadowcroft in Pennsylvania um, that they've carbon dated to 18,000 years ago. Um, and it was right at the edge of, of the glacial end moraine there. So, so we don't really know how long people uh, have been here, but at least 13,000 years. We're almost done glaciering now, but this is, uh, I included this because the Native Americans, uh, when you start breaking down their place names, you, uh, once you learn that their word for sand or sandy gravel is wreck away, or neck away or leck away depends they they could use three different consonants for that initial sound um, but anyway when you see <laughs> names like rockaway new jersey Rekawanis, uh which was a, a a native village on the east river rockaway on long island and marekawick uh i guess i don't have marekawick in there but that's uh that's what they called the big moraine hill in brooklyn and the ma in front of the Rekaway just makes it bigger. It's, it's a very expansive syllable. Uh, uh, so the big gravel pile was ma Rekawick. That was what they called Brooklyn. So language being affected by the glacier. There's one other really fun thing, and that is on the, on the Delaware River. Um, just up the ice sheet a little ways, just to the left of that word Rekawanis, um, there's a bend in the Delaware, and they they call that Mahakamak, and it means big lake, and there's no lake there now, but when glacial Lake Walkill, which I showed you earlier, uh, when when the glacier was receding and, and there was a glacial Lake Walkill, that's where it was and it, where it drained. And so their, their word preserves a lake that was there 14,000 years ago uh, that's no longer there. Um, so I, I really like that ability of language to, to sort of be a fly in amber and, uh, and, and transcend time. All right, so I'm gonna talk about the native folks and this is, this is the magic of the place. The Hudson River's <laughs> Hudson River is coming down. Is that a lie detector? Who's got a lie detector? <laughs> uh, the Hudson River splits the middle of this, and it's just showing you the uh, incredible amount of salt marsh, incredible amount of oyster bank and shellfish uh, uh, beaches, and uh, and that red stripe up in the upper left is a place called Aquakanonk. It says Weir Complex. In, in, the, uh, in the lower 20 miles of the Passaic River, there were 16 stone weirs across the Passaic. Um, and we're gonna talk more about that later. So these are the people. Um, the hardest thing for people who want to know more about, about human history in the area is sorting out group names. And uh, I, I hope that's legible for people. But basically, all you have to remember, this is worth talking about too. Uh, all you have to remember is these two guys, the Susquehannas and the Five Nations or the Haudenosaunee or the Longhouse Alliance, a lot of different names for them. They were Iroquoian language speakers continually at war with these guys who were Algonquian language speakers. And these, these various homelands, so, so let's see, Mohican, Housatonic, Muncie, Unami, Delaware, Nanticoke, uh, yeah, Conoy, way down here, um, were all Algonquian language speakers. So most of the place names here were given by these guys and look kind of like our place names up here in Maine. Um, 
you don't need to separate hack and sacks from uh, from Kichawanks, from Esopus Indians, from Catskill Indians, or anything else. Uh, that's a that's an exercise in futility because they intermarried. They could understand each other. Those were just place names, and and we'd never we'd never say, oh, Camden people are different than Rockport. Well, actually, we, we might, but, but 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 we wouldn't think they were that different, you know, and we wouldn't think it was a meaningful distinction. Uh, so now you've got to tip your heads ninety degrees to the right because north is uh, north is going up the Hudson River, out of screen to the uh, to the right, and this is this is just showing how how they reacted to it. And and again, don't worry about the words on this. I'm just trying to show you the kind of uh, mapping and infographics that I do for this project. Those those circles are where there were significant shell middens, um, and that was the big attraction of coming down here. The dotted lines show the paths that we've been able to reconstruct, and um, the uh, when you when you actually see this in real life, you the the salt marshes or freshwater marshes are tinted enough so that you can make those out. Um, but shellfish were far and away the main attraction uh, for, for them to come to this part of the world. And they, uh, now I, I said we'd talk about Aklakanok. That place name comes from Aklanikan, uh, which is that thing that they're using like a comb to sweep shad down the river um and the onk on the end of it is just a locative it just means at the place of so at the place of using the brush weir so uh people in canoes uh would would have this long like grapevine with with weighted brush hanging down and they would literally sweep the river to stone walls that met in a v where you could put a wooden trap in and they would drive the shad into the trap and take them as fast as they could bail them out and into canoes and, and kill them, you know, hundreds or even thousands uh, of shad would be taken at a time. The reason why the Passaic River was so good, it had a big shad run. It had the Great Falls just 30 miles up river uh, and fish couldn't go any farther than that. But shad are mainstream spawners. Uh, all they need is, is, a, is a, a river. Um, to do their spawning and what the indigenous people liked about it is it's not that big a river it's narrow enough you know you if you're going to weave a, a a brush comb to cross the hudson you're going to be weaving a while but these you know this is like a hundred yards across the passaic and they would uh, they would uh, could very efficiently get all the fish they needed in a smaller river and that's so non-colonial to think that way you know a, a, any yankee fisherman would say well geez um, if there's that many shad in the passaic just think what we could get at the hudson and then they'd they'd build some rig to get them you know uh and they'd they'd get 10 times more than they needed but they'd have it to sell you know which is kind of how the colonial mind works so now twist your head the other way because the Hudson's going this way. Uh, you can see Long Island going off out the top there. And these are just the different groups that would congregate at New York Bay um, to get oysters put up um, in the late summer and early fall because it was the best, the best food expenditure of energy that they could do in addition to the seashore being a nice place to be in August and September. Um, so there were these big council fires at places, that's what that orange dot is, uh, Burial Ridge on Staten Island, and a place just across it uh, in uh, Morgan, New Jersey, it was called Cheesequake, um, just south of South Amboy. Anyway, uh, they figured it out. Uh, they. As they did at Damariscotta, the shellfish resource was significant enough so it made sense to share rather than for one group to fight and try and possess it all. Because they didn't sell the stuff, you know, they didn't sell the surplus, they just needed what they needed. So they made, the, it, was a, it was a place where they could all go in and dry all the shellfish they needed to get through winter. Um, 
This is this is in Westchester County, um, and, and it's kind of a funky old um, USGS map. But one of the things that I've been doing, and I should I should have said at the start of this, we're working with M Mohican and Muncie uh, and 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 diff Matinecox, different groups on Long Island, basically any Algonquian group that wants uh access to our research and wants to uh collaborate with us and we actually invited a lot of indigenous leaders to new york when we started the project made them the promise that we uh we weren't in this to build our reputations and we weren't in it um to tell their story we're primarily researchers and the storytelling we do is just to help people understand and to help them retrieve lost paths uh, lost past. So in this case, uh, when you look through the record long enough, you find names for these different paths. Sometimes it'll just be some farmer's deed and his western boundary will be the Potidicus path or something. But anyway, if you look long enough, you can reconstruct where the paths go. And anytime you see a nexus of paths, like right around Bedford, New York, you know that there was something important going on there. Just like when roads come together in Searsmont, right, Rose? You know it's an important place, or or it was at the time they put those roads in. So, what was important about Bedford? Well, one of the clues is that Muscota path, because Muscota means prairie, burned land. Um, the uh, the and and sure enough, here's a place on that path called the Great Plain, basically a, a prairie that was maintained by burning. But the other thing that caught my eye, and it was lucky this uh, this particular USGS map showed stone walls. This was like in 1943. Mm -hmm. So all those black lines are stone walls. And that part of the world, if you've been there, is the stone walls everywhere. And I think that is because um, it was a place of native agriculture and, and the forests were cleared for agriculture. And and the, the Yankee farmers will tell you what happens when you when you cut the forest away. The next hundred years, the frost brings you up a new crop of rocks every spring, because with the trees gone, the frost makes deep in the ground, and then it floats up more rocks the next spring. So this landscape that was so littered with with rocks that got built into stone walls, I think it was probably because it had been cleared by native people for for decades or, or longer um, before the English came there. This one I'm going to skip. I'll, I'll just tell you the, the diagonal line going from the, the Muncie Council fire at Minisink Island in the Delaware River. Um, that's the Minisink path that goes all the way down to New York Bay and even down to Sandy Hook um, and the Jersey Shore. And that's how far they were willing to travel each year. And you can see some little smaller feeder lines going off that Minisink path uh, to, to different locations where the oyster gathering was really superior. And that was, that was a, an annual pilgrimage to, to make it down. It was actually closer to get to the shellfish cutting across to New York Bay than to go down the Delaware all the way to the, to the mouth of that river. So that's that's how the Muncie people uh, utilized New York Bay. All right, we may talk a little more about Indians, but I got I've got two other things because if you read the the press release in the paper, this project I'm on, uh, we call this work decolonizing history or, or decolonializing history. And and it's basically saying, you know, if you take away the three subsidies that this country is built on, which is land taken from indigenous people, uh, labor by enslaved Africans, and uh, relentless extraction of whatever natural resources the natural world had, if you take away those three freebies, uh, there's not much of a country left here, or a very different country would have resulted here. And since the kind of heroic histories, as I call them, that I grew up learning 
never really addressed that side of the balance sheet, uh, a lot of people, myself included, think it's time to, uh, to, to adjust the balance sheet. So um, the, the native people, we will talk a little bit more about where they went, but I wanted to show you this, and this, this I may have to go, go talk about a little. The, uh, just the, the pink things are countries. The green things are colonial, you know, new world sort of landscapes or places outside Europe that were full of resources. The darker the color, the more powerful the European country. The darker the connection, the more they're milking it. So in, in the late 1500s, everybody in Europe wanted to be Portugal and Spain because they had the gold and silver flowing from Central America and they had uh, sugar from sugar plantations in Brazil and they had dye wood, which was incredibly valuable. Anyway, they were they were the cock of the walk, um, you know, in the, in the late 1500s. The Dutch, uh, their armada got sunk in 1588, which was the same year the Dutch got independence. Mm -hmm. And the Dutch wasted little time in getting the Dutch East India Company, uh, getting the spices and silk, gold and silver from from the Mughals in India and pearls in the Pacific. So they had a good deal. Um, the the same investors in holland who were making money from this said well that's good what we need now is a dutch west india company and what they wanted to do and this is this is 400 <coughs> years ago this month october of 1623 they launched the the grand design which was that we will we the dutch using our navy will control the golden slaves uh, in Africa. We will hijack the Spanish and Portuguese treasure fleet out of here, and we will take over uh, the sugar plantations in Brazil, and whatever we can get from the West Indies, we'll get there too. Way up here is Russell Shorto's island at the center of the world, Manhattan, and it wasn't any big deal then. Uh, it, was, it was really, a bit player uh, in, in the global uh, economy of, of the 1600s. So anyway, that's, that's what's going on here. And the rivalry, rivalry between England and Holland, um, they both wanted the same thing. Uh, England never got as big a portion of, of here until finally when they did uh, get, their, get their mitts on India and, and kept it as long as they could. Um, but they really went at it hammer and tongs in North America and on the coast of Africa, um, trying, to, trying to get the lion's share of that. So I mention all this just so you realize that we weren't the center of anything over here. We're, we were a place that had some beaver fur and um, where they thought they could probably raise wheat and uh, cut, cut timber to make barrels to get the sugar and the good stuff back from Brazil. But that was about it. <clears throat> However, they, uh, they came to, to like what they saw here because uh, North America was so, the resources were so abundant and the way they saw it, and unfortunately the way some people still do, uh, is that you could never you could never run out of stuff, you know, whether it was heath hens on Long Island or or strawberries that grew every place the Indians had been because they burned the landscape and strawberries do great in a burned landscape. Um, the shellfish uh, resources. Anyway, they the, the Europeans eventually came to see, starting with Killian Van Rensselaer up around Albany, that you know, we could settle here and we could we could make money on other stuff besides beaver fur. Um, so so settlement began, but we're going to look at beaver for a second. And this this is uh, I'm going to step on the accelerator here for a bit. Beaver are, are creatures of watersheds and um, it's really hard to map watersheds in a way that people can understand visually and remember. And I fiddled around, you know, rivers are like worms squirming and uh, uh, didn't want to do that. 
I thought, well, I can highlight the rivers that matter, but it still looks like spaghetti. And then I thought, well, I could color code them. Uh, and and uh, so I, I was thinking, yeah, but it's still, it's still a mess. And then I finally decided that uh, what you don't need is a strictly geographical map, you need a relational one. And by this time, I realized what I really needed was a subway map. <laughs> so, so here's the, here's the fur transit lines of North America. <laughs> um, but I'm going to take you through real fast one at a time. Some, sometimes I think I could do like a Tom Lehrer song, you know, to, to go along with this, like Champlain came over in 60, uh, whatever. But anyway, Champlain did come first. Uh, and and rightly figured the fur, the fur is better the farther north you go and more of it can come down this St. Lawrence River. He sailed the main coast down as far as Cape Cod, um, that's southern Maine, <laughs> uh, and he, uh, he concluded that Quebec was the best place to be and he was right uh, and he, he was established there before 1610. The Dutch were the next ones on the scene. And they, uh, they said, well, we've got a pretty good deal uh, here because we're closer to the West Indies and can supply them. And the other great thing is that the Hudson River, unlike most rivers, uh, you can go 150 miles up river just by riding the tide uh, because of that glacial reaming, which made it so deep. So uh, Albany was actually more important to them than New Amsterdam, which we call Manhattan now. Uh, and they got a toehold there, um, you know, by, by 1610, 1611. A guy named Jacob Elkins managed the trading post at Albany starting in 1614 through 1618. And he, he was the one more than anyone else who figured out that wampum, beads made from clamshells and, and periwinkle shells, could work as money. Uh, and that these natives uh, sort of understood the whole trading process and would bring beaver furs in exchange for European guns, European kettles, fire water, uh, and wampum. He did things like kidnapping uh, important indigenous chiefs and ransoming them for wampum on the Connecticut coast and then using the wampum to trade up in Albany. But the other thing he did was to trade guns to the five nations up the Mohawk River. Uh, and the more guns you gave the five nations, the more they could creep up towards the St. Lawrence and actually stage raids and on some occasions even plug off the St. Lawrence. And all of the people in the fur buying chain thought in New York or New Amsterdam thought that was a good idea. Um, so they kept the guns going to the Mohawks and they kept getting more and more of the fur coming down through the Hudson. The Johnny come latelys up here in New England. Uh, they, were, they were behind the times. The Kennebec and Penobscot were the best suppliers. The Connecticut River brought some furs down and the House of Tonic brought some furs down. The 1628 trading post in what we call Augusta today, but they called it Kushnock, um, is how the Plymouth colony bailed themselves out of Hawk for the money they'd borrowed to move over here. Uh, that was the only thing they could do uh, to pay their bills back in England was to trade for furs with the natives. And, and so Kushnock was an important place, but the Dutch actually told the English uh, because they, were, they, they had a lot of back and forth. The, the, Pilgrims had lived in Leiden, Holland, you know, before they came here. A lot of marriages between Dutch women and English men and vice versa. The Dutch told them about the wampum trade and to the extent that they could, uh, they got furs out of New England using it, but small potatoes. The next big advances were when the Susquehanna and Delaware River came online and William Penn figured out that, you know, if you go up this Susquehanna and then over the east branch of it, you can actually get all the way to the Mohawk River. Uh, so whatever gets intercepted from Canada and gets brought down the Mohawk, we could have a trading station there and bring it down through Philadelphia, uh, ultimately. But, I mean, Philadelphia is on the Delaware, but 
There's a dotted line. He walked that dotted line, or he wanted to. Thomas Dongan, who was the royal governor of New York, said, not so fast, buddy, and, uh, and went up there and plied the five nations and, and bought the Susquehanna River from them before Penn could. Uh, so, so a lot of jockeying for position going on. Penn wound up with it eventually, but by then the beaver were mostly trapped out. And this is what brought us to the point of war with the French in the 1750s was the question of who was going to control the Mississippi Basin, because uh, just as the Hudson lets you tap into Canada, so does the Mississippi drainage basin. And whoever controlled that, um, and, and the French were the first there to look around La Salle in 1682, but the English in uh, in New York really wanted to control it too. Um, so this led to the inevitable war between the French and the English, and which in, in classic English fashion, we call it the French and Indian War because they were the bad guys. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I imagine they called it something different, <laughs> but I call it the Seven Years' War. And that's, that's what led to it was the question of who was gonna get the furs down the Mississippi. Okay. Jacob Elkins, because he introduced the idea of wampum as money, it had a really bad effect on the Long Island folks because their numbers were low, uh, they, they weren't too powerful, and they had the best wampum shells. So all of the more powerful inland groups uh, put, the, put the collar on the Long Island guys and, and said, just, just keep drilling those beads and... Uh, uh, send us enough of them and we'll leave you alone. So they were paying tribute wampum to everyone around them. Uh, that's That upset the balance of native politics and that's another whole talk. Um, this is down back on the Hudson um, and the, uh, the, first, the first tension between Native Americans and the Dutch in New Amsterdam, this is where it happened. Um, the upriver groups, the Mohawks specifically, and the Mohicans, who the Mohawks had rendered as tributaries, came down river and thumped some heads and drove the guys on the lower Hudson down to this place uh, called Communipa. Now we call it Jersey City. They were there because of this oyster bank, which is seven square was seven square miles of oyster bank, and they knew they could feed themselves there in the dead of winter, which is when it happened. Um, more on that in a bit. Um, here's here's what the tension between indigenous people and the Europeans looked like. It started when the English. Uh, decided they needed to massacre the Pequots in 1637 uh, in Mystic. Uh, and they wound up getting their land, getting the wampum tribute from all the Long Island groups who had been paying the Pequots before. And the Dutch in New Amsterdam looked at it and said, hey, that could work down here. And all of these subsequent massacres coming down Long Island Sound um, culminating in this one, Pavonia in 1643, which was at that oyster bank I just showed you. It was, it was an attempt by the English and Dutch to use genocide to acquire land uh, and to, to get rid of the uh, Native Americans around the area where they wanted to live. Um, here's another source of tension. This is the Elizabethtown purchase, just uh, just on the west side of New York Bay. The dark brown is what the Indians thought they were selling. Uh, the, the light brown is what the Elizabeth Towners claimed they had bought. And as you can imagine, that caused some hard feelings. And the fact that all of those subsequent purchases after that 1664 Elizabeth Town purchase, uh, grudgingly, the, the English, who had kicked the Dutch out of New Amsterdam by now, so now it was New York, they, they eventually had to actually pay for all of these pieces that they had tried to get for free uh, in 1664. But again, this, this made the native people sensitive when they tried that. So this is, this is the dispossession that we talk about. Uh, 
when starting with their original homeland, going going through the 1600s, uh, little toehold at first in Albany and New Amsterdam, pockets going up the rivers as fur traders moved up the rivers because that's how you played the game. If you were a fur trader, you had to be farther upriver than the competition. That, and that, that just happened everywhere in North America. Uh, and, um, but, but when it really starts going fast uh, is after 1700, uh, by, which, by which point, um, you know, there's probably been uh, four epidemics uh, by then, smallpox being the worst. Um, so the natives are losing population. They are becoming uh, too attached to, uh, to rum and they are um, uh, being given uh, goods and, and liquor on credit um, because the, the English and the Dutch both knew that they would not be able to repay. And so all they could do is take their land as payment. So a lot of native land came as a way of staying out of prison uh, to, to pay off debts for goods extended on credit. And pretty much all gone by 1768. Uh, everybody was in on the act and, and the land acquisition and speculation got so rampant after. So this is 1763. They've just signed the, the Treaty of Paris. Uh, the French and Indian War has been decided and the English won. So they've answered the question of, will it be the French or the English that makes money off North America? Now it's the English and the English are dying to get their hands on Ohio, especially. Nobody more so than this guy who was, who was 35 at, at the time um, when he wrote his surveyor in 1767 saying, oh, don't worry about this royal proclamation. It, it's not gonna last. The King of England passed it saying, that the English colonies in America couldn't extend west of the uh, of the crest of the Allegheny Mountains. That's what that line is. It's the high land. And he was saying, no, the colonies have to stay between the top of the Alleghenies and the seacoast. Only the king can get any more land in the interior. And Washington and his surveyor are, are saying, well, we, we, we're going to get our dibs on it, whether you have a proclamation or not. And, and they weren't the only ones. Um, but Washington wound up with 200,000 acres or so by the time he was an old man. Um, this guy, um, who we think of as a, a wonderful grandfatherly type, um, had his own idea that he wanted to be the governor of a royal colony on the uh, in the Illinois Territory, out on the out on the. Uh, you know, up somewhere out around the confluence of the Ohio and Mississippi and, and northward up through Illinois. And there's this big problem because the Indians are staying around the frontier. And this is where he's writing a friend in England saying, we, we, we've got to have some bloodhounds to hunt these guys uh, because they're messing up the frontier. And and so it just, it just shows you, um, you know, how everybody and especially people of power and influence were focused on westward expansion here so here's what happened to the to the indians in the east their original homelands are in color and all these dots of the different villages that they were moved through uh, between 1700 and 1800 uh, just continually pushed west and it doesn't it doesn't end here i just sort of ran out of energy but they go down they go down the wabash and white river in indiana and down into missouri and kansas and oklahoma but that was a promise that we made the in the the native folks we were collaborating with is that we wouldn't talk about them like ghosts who used to be here but now they're gone we don't know where they went uh we, we told them we would tell the whole story of the places they went and it's a good thing uh, or some good things that come from it when you do track them through all these refugee villages up and down like the Susquehanna lo and behold I found this uh, photo of of a brush weir being used 
on the Susquehanna River. And the Quaker, a guy named Joshua Sharpless, who traveled up the Susquehanna in uh, 1798, he's talking with the Indians there and they say, yeah, we, we used to live on the seacoast, but the, the white people took that land, so now we live here. So these were Muncies from the Hudson River uh, transplanted on the upper Allegheny and, and uh, uh, so, excuse me, this, this, this was on the Allegheny. This is farther west than the Susquehanna even. But those are Muncie people and they're doing that brush weir just the way I had, had sketched it um, without ever seeing it, but from reading missionary descriptions. So that's probably the only picture of Muncie people actually fishing that way that there is. Um, let's see. Oh, this, this will go very quickly. Um, one of the things that we do is to try and show dispossession in an animated fashion. So here's, here's Pennsylvania going bye-bye, you know, just all of the different transactions. Uh, that was a big one. That was William Penn's heirs. Uh, who are the proprietors of Pennsylvania, who went to the 1754 conference in Albany, which Ben Franklin thought was going to be about organizing colonial defense against the French. But it turns out that the Pens were there to get land, and uh, it didn't take too much liquor before they got some signatures and uh, got 10, 10 million acres of land for 5,000 pounds or something like that. Um, and the the really bad thing about it is they bought from the five nations the land that they were buying was lived on by algonquian groups that had been displaced and shawnee people people who weren't at the table when when the deal was cut in albany and that almost led to war so the pen said well we'll give some of it back but we've got to keep this really good spec uh, stretch in the center of the state here um so they relinquished some a Lenape chief named Tidiaskung and his kind of ragtag bunch of followers said, well, we need a homeland too. So, so they got a very temporary uh, uh, give back of some land on the Susquehanna. Uh, Tidiaskung's entire village burned <laughs> quite mysteriously in 1763 and he uh, he was burned to death in his wigwam along with most of the people in that village um so they didn't keep it long and then finally uh there was a little bit a bit of a war in pennsylvania between the pennsylvania white people and the connecticut white people Connecticut folks said their grant went all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So uh, so this choice land up the Susquehanna, they actually had several Pennamite wars between Pennsylvania and Connecticut people uh, over that property. And then finally, they got the last of it in 1784. Okay, now we're going to be as quick as we can and talk about <laughs> enslavement, um, because that's one of the other real pillars, and we don't think growing up in the North about what an issue it was, but um, the amount of uh, enslaved Africans brought to the sugar plantations in the West Indies from 1640 onward, that was the source of uh, enslaved Negroes that were then, after they were taught to follow commands in English, were then brought up to New Amsterdam, uh, Boston, places like that. Um, these are the guys who bumped the Dutch out of Africa. Uh, every, every time we say the name New York, we're honoring James, the Duke of York, who, who moved uh, about 100,000 enslaved people uh, to, to the New World in 17 years in, the, in 1672 to 1689 there. All the guys uh, these are the two guys, Carteret and Berkeley, who are given not just New Jersey, but also the Carolinas. Edmund Andros was the governor of the Dominion of New England. Uh, Dongan was the royal governor of New York and instructed to pass policies favorable to the Royal African Company, um, which, which their two irons in the fire were, well, three, uh, were African gold, African slaves, and ivory. Um, so that's their... If you ever hear reading reading something uh, 
you know, like Dickens, and he's talking about somebody paying a guinea for something. This is a guinea. It's made from gold from the Guinea coast, and that elephant with the castle behind it is the trademark of the or the symbol of the Royal African Company. Um, most of the sugar plantations were on Barbados. A lot of these guys moved up to acquire land in uh, what was now New York. And, and the, just notice those bottom names, Kingsland and Sanford. Um, here's, here's how New Amsterdam just turned to New York. Here's how it operated. Um, Kings, Kings County, uh, New York, 32% of the population was enslaved. Queens County was was not much better, about 20%. But basically all up and down the Hudson, all around New York Bay, an average, an average of 18 to 20% of the populace was enslaved. Um, it, uh, yeah, we don't, we don't, uh, no. That's quite shocking to a northern person. It is, it is. We don't hear that. I, I don't know how to get rid of that bar on the bottom, Ken, maybe you do, but um here's a slave trader's house on new york bay and it's uh, maybe you can see the little yellow dot here he thomas brown did very well um there's his house it's right by anheuser bush's corporate office for new york new jersey here's uh, the liberty national golf course statue of liberty is right out here uh, and uh um slaves were brought ashore here and uh um shackled in the basement of that house which which uh which then became in later years it became the greenville yacht club uh, um but anyway it's no big deal we can we can work on it um but yes yeah, so so there was an active slave trade in in what was now uh, new york city Okay. Uh, now it's not advancing, Ken. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what I've done here. Oh. Well, well, that's all right. So. Uh, what do you do when you have slaves? Uh, and if you remember um, Kingsland and Berry, we're going to talk about them. This is this is what the salt marsh hay looks like on the meadows in Ipswich, Massachusetts, or on the the meadow lands in between the Hack and Sack and Passaic River in New Jersey. Uh, what it did look like: uh, the haycocks uh, built on what they call staddles, which were just posts holding it up so it could season in the in the sun and breeze um, and it's a beautiful place to look at but but maybe maybe not such a beautiful place to work um, those salt marshes were the most important thing to the to the settlers from new england who moved down and started a town in newark in 1667 Here's their lottery divvying up the salt marsh uh, meadows. The reason probably makes sense uh, to, to a lot of you. Um, when everything around is wilderness and you need to feed cows and horses and pigs uh, a salt marsh, they, they, cows actually really like salt marsh hay. And, and this was a place where you could go... Uh, in a turnkey operation, get land for next to nothing and turn your animals loose on the salt marsh and, and they would prosper. So um, those salt marshes in the Meadowlands, before they were invaded by the Phragmites reed that's there now, um, the, the salt marsh was important. The place we're gonna look at is inside that red triangle though. Yeah. This is so this is up Passaic Rivers on the left, Hackensack River on the right. 
the Meadowlands is between them here. You can see giant stadium up uh, two thirds of the way up on the right hand side in, in the air photo. And but what I want to call your attention to is all the ditches uh, that, that are visible in this 1891 USGS map. So all these straight lines are the ditches in that salt marsh um, that you had to dig to be able to grow salt marsh hay. Um, I'm going to give you two guesses who dug most of those dishes. And to help you guess, I'm going to go back to our friends, Captain Barry and Captain Kingsland, who just happened to have plantations in the Barbados. And so uh, when, when John Berry came up here, whose name is preserved in Berry Creek, he came with 32 enslaved Africans. And there's more salt marsh ditches in his portion of the uh, Meadowlands than anywhere else. Um, and uh, you can still see them in a Google Earth image from today. Kingsland owned on the lower side of that dashed yellow line, Barry owned on the upper side of it. And those ditches that are still visible in the salt marsh, um, some of them go back to the 1600s um, and were probably dug by enslaved labor to grow salt marsh hay. Um, here's, here's a description. <laughs> and th this is, that's what the work, you know, looked like. And uh, this is this is a white farmer in Ipswich saying how we feel sorry for the horses because there's no place like a salt marsh for mosquitoes and for green headed horse flies right and. Uh, so if you substitute that word horses and 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 put in enslaved Africans, I, I think you get an idea of what summer work in the Meadowlands would have been like. Um, digging there the, is a sign on Cranes Beach in Ipswich uh, during the summer that says "Greenhead season, no refunds." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see people walking down the beach with blood running down their legs. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, I, the, the ditches had to be cut out with turf spades, at least two feet deep uh, through the thick matted roots of the salt marsh hay, and then you would take the dirt you dug out and heap it up and make a dike around the uh, the lawn of hay that you were preparing to keep the high tides from overflowing it. And that drained it enough so you could get out there and, and mow it with a scythe uh, in the summer. Um, anyway, and this is this is one of my favorite images because um, in in addition to seeing um, remnant uh, salt salt marsh hay operations. This is this is in Rockaway, Long Island, but coming right down to the shore and a whole lot of it right on the shore, just out of the frame to the upper right, is the oldest country club in America, the the uh, Rockaway Hunting Club, and it's called that because before it was a golf club and a tennis club, it was a place for fox hunting. Um, and shooting and other other gentlemen sports, you know, of the late 1700s. But uh, anyway, so so the the proximity of of uh, what was once a wild salt marsh and then was uh, a salt marsh that the first settlers on white settlers on Long Island really needed to feed livestock, and now it's a, it's kind of a playground. Um, There's a lot a lot of history in a small space. The last, the last one I'm going to touch on is just the taking from the environment, which white European culture feels entitled to do. We've got this, we've got this guidebook that a lot of us subscribe to that, that gives us dominion over, over everything we see around us. And, uh, and in the 1600s and 1700s, that included uh, the heathen people in these new lands you were going to. It was a, it was a very uh, generous license that they were given. So coming over here and, you know, un unlike native culture, which took what it needed to live, uh, you know, our commercial interests direct us to take what you need for yourself and any surplus you can get your hands on, you sell and you have markets around the world. 
And so by the time, basically the first ecologist, Per Kamm, a, a Swedish, he called himself a natural economist, but, but he was what we call an ecologist today. By the time he came over in 1750, he was like, this place is falling apart. It, they, they can't keep doing this. They're, they, they're cutting all the Atlantic white cedar and nobody's replanting any. Uh, he talks to the old people on the Delaware River and the Hudson, and they say, oh, yeah, the oysters are only half the size they were when I was a boy, and, and you never see the ducks like you used to, and, and uh, yeah, the evergreens are gone because we, you know, we cut those down to make tar uh, for the British Navy, and uh, so, so it was an ecosystem on the verge of collapse 25 years before it, we became uh, an independent nation here. Uh, thank, thanks to these extractive practices. Here's just one example. Uh, these are the iron mines, uh, primarily iron mines. Some of them, as you get out into Pennsylvania, are, are coal mine. But if you look at those orange dots in northern New Jersey, those are iron mines, and each cluster is more than 100 mines. Um, so iron mining was, was really big, and here's an example which here's an example of, a, of an iron mine and that's to scale and unfortunately the bottom's kind of cluttered but so you know this is drawn at the same scale this is the george washington bridge um, so there's a two, so you could put the george washington bridge underground in this in this one there we go thank you ken thank you so those weren't bog iron mines. Those no, no, that was hard iron. Yeah, yeah, iron ore. Ringwood is one of the one of the locations in northern New Jersey. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, so there's the George Washington Bridge. There's the Mount Pleasant mine, and Mount Pleasant was just one of many um, such mines. You know. And we're gonna we're gonna kind of end it in Jersey City because it's really a nice American microcosm, I think. Um, no, no, it really is. There's there's so much history in such a small area there. So on the left is the pre-contact uh, west bank of the Hudson with salt marshes, islands in them. That red dotted line is the native path to the oyster bank. All the old Dutch maps call those. Uh, Ellis Island and Liberty Island, as we call them today, they called them the Oyster Islands. And this oyster bank stretched all the way down to the tip of land in Bayonne. I've, I've kept the ghost image of the original shoreline in the center, uh, but on the right is, is what it looked like in 1880. Um, so a lot of fill had happened. And here's what was going on in 1880. Um, Jersey City itself had was made on paper in 1804 by a bunch of Federalist investors who said, you know, we can make a killing as a rival to New York shipping. Um, and, and we won't sell any property there, we'll rent it. <laughs> that's, that's the American way. We'll, we'll hang on to it and we'll rent it to businesses and they can ship. And they signed up investors and, and launched it without checking first that New York actually claimed ownership all the way to the shore, uh, to, to the west bank of the Hudson. So, so their shipping plans got put on hold for about 30 years before they could, they could finally convince a judge that New York couldn't own the water right immediately off their shore. But Jersey City was, was a pure and simple speculation of, of grid, and you'll see that in a second. The Central Railroad sticks out way into the Hudson River. That was the railroad that the immigrants who came to Ellis Island immediately got on trains uh, at the Central Railroad of New Jersey and were distributed around the country. We needed them because of that Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, right? But we, we had to have a uh, if we couldn't have a free labor force anymore, we had to have the cheapest one possible. So uh, that that was when um, the heyday of immigration in this country and things weren't going well in Europe. I mean, they had good reasons to to come here too. Um, same thing, the Lehigh Valley Railroad built way out into the river. 
both the Central Railroad and the Lehigh Valley Railroad were all about getting to Pennsylvania to get anthracite coal, which was the best fuel for the whole iron working industry. All, any industry that you needed power, burning anthracite coal was the way to do it in the, in the late 1800s. Um, and then we, uh, at the same time, we had to have the Statue of Liberty put up, welcoming these low-cost laborers and tenants uh, <laughs> to, to their new home. Um, the Morris Canal was a great idea, sort of, and that was to get the iron from those mines in northern New Jersey to the New York metropolitan area and, and to Newark, where they could be made into useful uh, industrial components, but they no sooner got the Morris Canal dug across New Jersey to Pennsylvania than the first steam locomotives were invented and these rail lines immediately began out competing the Morris Canal. But so there's, there's just so much storytelling about uh, post-revolutionary war America going on in this strip of Jersey City. And here's what it looks like today. This, uh, this little spot right here is called Caven Point, and it's a bird sanctuary. And this little spot right here is called Liberty National Golf Club, and it's owned by a guy named Paul Fireman, who spent $150 million uh, reclaiming old railroad yards and turning it into a, a luxury golf course. And if you have a spare $500,000, uh, you could at least pay the initiation fee if they would let you into this private club. Um, and, and then it's only $25,000 a year for your membership after that initiation fee. He desperately wants to get this nature preserve, which is the last original ground on the lower Hudson, to have three, of, three, three more holes on his golf course out here. So that's the battle that's being fought in New Jersey right mm -hmm. now. Well, how do you trying to do up in way of sun is tall, I'm not sure. What's that? I think that's what Will Hardy's trying to do. Yes, yes, that's right, that's right. Uh, well, I, I'm actually, you can probably guess which side I'm working on in this little tiff, uh, uh, supplying information. And here's, here's, uh, here's well, I think this might be the last image, just showing um, the, the island that the, uh, Hackensack people called Aresic, which I think is about shell heaps being on it, surrounded by salt marsh. And this is that 1804 development plan, complete with the rental schedules for whichever unit of, uh, of business you wanted to, to rent from them. And there's their uh, 16 docks going, double-sided piers going out into the Hudson. That didn't happen for another 30 years, but, but this was the the speculation document that that they got people to sign on to and that's why we have a jersey city there were three houses in jersey city uh in 1804 when when this plan was launched okay that and that's that's the I, I was wrong i did have i did have this one more just because some of you may have heard about the african burying ground in manhattan that was a big project uh you know, 15 years ago, when when that was discovered on an old map, um, there's one here in Jersey City on this 1841 map, and the 1841 map is a really good one, really accurate one. So by overlaying it on a modern Google Earth image, um, putting a circle on the burying ground and then deleting it, I have a circle left showing us whose residential neighborhood those uh, those enslaved people who who worked uh, in this uh, very productive field in Communipa in, starting in 1636 they, they had enslaved people helping the Dutch farmer who was here so the the uh, Africans buried in that burying ground, which is not recognized uh, no stones there are houses on houses and streets on top of it. That's just another uh, uh, victim of urban uh, sprawl that, and, and because maybe, maybe it was uh, enslaved Africans who were buried there, nobody has, uh, has yet convinced uh, 
convince the people who live there that the cemetery ought to be recognized. So we supply documents like this to, to uh, groups who actually do care about uh, that sort of thing. So that's an awful lot of talking. I apologize for talking so long, um, but it's, it's, I describe it to people as a big project about a small place. You know, it's, it's a very small area, but it's a good one to look at if you want to see uh, the real American balance sheet. And if you think something ought to be done about it, you know, you can, you can do a lot of teaching in New York Harbor. So anyway, thank you for bearing with me for all of this. And, uh, it's warm in here. <laughs> I'm sorry. If if anybody uh, has a question or or a comment you want to share, feel free and feel free to go out and breathe some fresh air if you if you want to. Well, Carrie, have you done anything with the trade routes for what Native Americans coming from? Any lines as far as yeah, so so they uh, they did they did have a fully developed network of trails because they wanted to get to to New York Bay too. One of the amazing things is that when they were putting in somebody's foundation uh, by Verrazano Narrows uh, in the late eighteen hundreds, they dug up several cartloads full of preformed spearheads that were buried in the ground there. So that that kind of mass production suggests that it was a center of trade for native people. And and um, because you have you have five rivers, the. Uh, the <laughs> let's see. Yes, yes. And, and, and the way you remember it is to look at your hand and. and uh, it's five rivers and, and the, the words you say are real pirates have huge earrings. <laughs> real is Raritan, <laughs> pirates is Passaic, have is the Hackensack, huge is the Hudson, and it is huge, and earrings is the East River. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyways, the convergence, it's not a real river, but the convergence of all those water routes on New York Bay was one way to get there. But they had the full complement of foot trails, just like the roads going to Kushnok, you know. Um, so they could come by land too, yeah. You know, the history you've shared with us uh, it leaves one with a lot of shame. Uh, where do you go with that shame? Well, you know, I don't, I don't have that myself because um, we we can't we can't own everything that our culture did personally you know i i make my peace by saying all i control is what i do going forward and what i do is actually you know in some cases giving back cultural information to indigenous people but but no i think i think i think the day of reckoning is still ahead and uh, whether it's whether it's in the form of, of just some national recognition, you know, that our culture's belief that people can own land, that people can own parts of the world, to me it strikes it strikes me as being similar to the fleas on a dog's back, thinking they own the dog, you know, and we'd kind of laugh at that proposition. And yet our culture, it's very ingrained to think that we can and do own the earth. Um, and if we can wean ourselves from that kind of thinking and see ourselves as tenants uh, who have been bad tenants to this point and, and try and make some amends in how we take care of the earth and, and take care of how we treat groups that, uh, that whose backs we climbed on, you know, to get this country. Um, you know, we can all move in that direction to the extent that our personal uh, um, resources and conscience move us to, and that's that's uh, and and Native people are very appreciative just just hearing anyone say that they want to move in that direction because you you aren't going to turn this super tanker we call America around on a dime, it's going to be a lot of nudges uh, in the in the trajectory. Well, we may uh, have to leave it there and carry it. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, thanks very, very much. Yeah. <laughs>